All right, welcome back. Uh, so yeah, let's go ahead and let's talk about other flood stories. Uh, so we're continuing our theme of destruction, um, but there are other stories that carry the theme of the flood. Um, one of them, yeah, so there's a diagram actually in the book on page uh, 183, if you ever want to check it out, that compares uh, three different flood stories. Uh, but I'm just going to go through them uh, real quick here. So let's start with the one that comes to us uh, from the Greeks. Or, you know, actually, hmm. uh, yeah, let's do the Greek one, then we'll do the other one. Okay, so the Greek flood story is um, the story of Deucalion and Pyrrha. So the story goes something like this. Zeus was angry at uh, human beings for uh, their violence and their arrogance. They were challenging the gods. Uh, specifically in the version we of it we have, uh, that you can read in the book if you want, um, from Ovid's Metamorphoses, uh, Zeus's motivation is that a guy tried to kill and eat him, um, which is not something you want to do to your gods. Uh, so basically this guy um, was trapping travelers and uh, killing them and, uh, you know, cooking them up and eating them. And um, the thing in Greek mythology is that you should always be careful about how you treat your guests because one of them might be Zeus in disguise. And in this case it was. And Zeus grew very angry. So he punished this guy by turning him into a creature with fangs and claws that ate human beings. And so this guy became uh, the first wolf. Um, and so uh, in Ovid's version of the story, that sets Zeus off, and he's not content to just turn a guy into a wolf. He wants to uh, really punish uh, human beings. Uh, so he decides to destroy them in a great flood. Uh, but um, one of these human beings is actually part god. He is the son of Prometheus. Uh, he is, um, you know, descended from the Titan who Zeus punished so severely. Um, and it's interesting because he gets some forewarning of the flood. Uh, not sure if it's from Prometheus directly. It might depend on the version that you're looking for. But he knows that there is going to be this flood. So he has to figure out what to do. So with his wife, Pyrrha, he um, uh, gets into a box. No giant ark here, just a wooden chest. And this is something that appears a lot in uh, Greek mythology is people being in wooden chests for some reason. I don't know what it is. Um, but uh, he gets into the box uh, with Pyrrha and they ride out the flood. They're just being knocked around for quite some time while the flood is going on. And then finally the floodwaters go down and um, the pair find themselves on a mountain, uh, which is very similar to um, the flood in Noah's Ark. Um, so they are up on this high mountain and, um, you know, Zeus realizes that he, he missed a couple. He missed these two. Um, so what do they do? Well, they pray to Zeus uh, not to destroy them. Um, and he agrees uh, because he appreciates uh, the prayer um, that they're giving him. And, you know, making sacrifices and, and worshiping the gods is very important to the gods. Um, and so um, they eventually pray at an oracle, uh, or at least the location of an oracle, and an oracle will give you important instructions about what to do in the future. Um, this is a real thing that the Greeks had as a sort of tradition. Um, uh, but the oracle will always phrase it in a cryptic way. Uh, so you have to kind of figure out this riddle. And so, you know, if you do it, if, if you're, the prediction doesn't come true, they can always say you were doing it wrong. Um, but here the oracle absolutely works because it's the mythology. Um, and so the oracle's prophecy is, uh, here's how you repopulate the earth you must throw the bones of your mother behind you. And so they puzzle over that for some time, but eventually they figure out, oh, they're talking about um, earth, mother earth, Gaia as this mother goddess, more or less. And so they pick up stones and they start throwing them behind them. And all the stones that Deucalion threw uh, became men and the rocks that Pyrrha threw became women. And this was what led um, to the repopulation of the earth and the reemergence of humanity. So this is interesting that there would be this Greek story of the flood and Zeus doing all this. Uh, it reminds me, the idea of challenging the gods reminds me in, of some stuff in um, Hesiod's Ages of Man. And that's an alternate take on Zeus destroying a uh, human civilization, right? He destroys uh, the civilizations uh, or they destroy themselves. 
Um, and this could almost fit into that framework, except the flood isn't mentioned in Hesiod. So you almost got to wonder if these are related myths. Okay, and then the other big one is the story, uh, the other big flood story is the story of uh, Utnapishtim. Uh, now this is from the Epic of Gilgamesh. I uh, want to make a quick clarification because I know this confuses people a lot of the time. Um, Utnapishtim is the um, guy who survives the flood in this story, not Gilgamesh. We're going to look at Gilgamesh later on when we talk about heroes, uh, but some people think Gilgamesh is the flood guy. No, Gilgamesh is the protagonist of this story, and along the way, along the course of his journey, he meets this guy, Utnapishtim, uh, who is very similar to Noah, or to Deucalion for that matter. Um, so, the gods decide to wipe out humans, now, what's the reason given for it here? Well, basically, they were just being too loud. They were having loud, wild parties. Now, this is a rich irony, because what uh, got the gods in trouble in the first place with Tiamat? It was they were having parties that were too loud. So it's very hypocritical of the gods to say this about humanity. But, you know, you get older, uh, you become older gods. Now you've got these bratty humans running around, and you want to tell them to turn down the volume. Um, but the gods don't just send a message. They just decide they're going to wipe out the human beings. They decide as a group, which is interesting. It's not, um, you know, in, uh, in the Deucalion story, it's sort of Zeus's agenda, and he talks um, some of the other gods into it, and some of them agree, some of them disagree. Um, in uh, the book of Genesis, it's just one god. Um, and here, Utnapishtim, in Utnapishtim's story, it's a group of gods. They have like a council where they meet. And that's kind of a classic Mesopotamian idea is that the gods are almost like voting on what they want to do. Um, so um, there is actually a subversive element here though, uh, because the gods get riled up, but the leader of the gods, um, so this is kind of almost the opposite of Zeus, the leader of the gods sneaks a message to Utnapishtim telling him how to build a boat. Um, maybe this is because Utnapishtim um, is a good guy. Um, it's not super clear, but um, Ea uh, tells him to despise worldly, go worldly goods. Um, so on the one hand, that's very practical for building a boat. It might also be um, a, uh, you know, a sign that Utnapishtim is a more sort of righteous dude. He is um, more uh, detached from greed and things like that. So Utnapishtim gets on his boat, and again, Utnapishtim is told to take all the animals of the world. Um, he's also told to take all the seeds of the world, uh, to regrow all the plants, which I think is a nice touch um, and a little bit different. So he builds this boat according to specific instructions. Oh, and I should mention, Ea has a very sneaky way of getting him this message, uh, which is that he's, been, he's promised he will not tell uh, Utnapishtim but he hasn't promised that he won't just tell Utnapishtim's house while Utnapishtim happens to be there. So this is a, a fairy tale and mythological motif that you see a couple times. The idea of don't say it to a person, say it to an inanimate object to get around your promises, which is kind of funny. Okay, so Utnapishtim gets on the boat with his family. Um, and it's at this point that the gods open the dams of the sky waters. It's very specific. It's go, they go up, it's like they open the floodgates, um, not just leaking, but, uh, but actively, you know, drawing some sort of barrier aside. But actually for the gods, they are forced to flee. They got, get caught up in it and they have to flee to the mountaintops too. Um, they're not uh, in a good position. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they are panicking too, um, and they only barely get out of the flood, <laughs> which is kind of funny compared to gods like, you know, Sirius, I know everything and I am designing this perfect scenario. Here the gods are much more comic, comedic. And then finally the floodwaters recede, and what does Unapishtim do? Well, he sends out three birds. He sends out a dove, a swallow, and a raven. And finally, when the raven, uh, you know, brings him back a plant and then fails to come back after that, he knows it's safe to return to land. And it's interesting here that the gods regret their choices. Uh, they uh, they uh, apologize to Utnapishtim and say, that was a bad idea. We kind of got uh, hyped up here. 
um, made some mistakes, which is pretty rich when you destroy all of humanity. Uh, but that's how Mesopotamians uh, tended to feel about their gods, right? They were chaotic. They um, were like the river flooding at random times whenever they felt like it. So you could very much believe it of these gods that they would be like, yeah, let's flood them all. And then be like, oh no, what have we done? Um, so how do they make it up to Unafishtim? They make him immortal. So he has existed from the dawn of time. He and his wife are now immortal and Gilgamesh visits them hundreds of years later. So of these three stories, you know, they may have origin se originated separately, but if we think about it, which one would be the most likely candidate to be the first of these flood stories to come about? Probably the Mesopotamian Sumerian story, right? Uh, because this is the part of the world that is flooding all the time and is so focused on water and thinking about that. Um, and then it would make sense that it would jump to um, the Jewish world, um, which is not really a place where floods happen very often in Jerusalem, but it would be imported in when the Jews were in Babylon. And then after that, the Greeks after that, probably most likely, uh, because they were very far away from flooding and from that part of the world. Um, and they didn't really, their rivers were, they didn't have big rivers that would flood like that. Uh, so they didn't really have any experience with that. Now this all, when this story was rediscovered through the tablets of uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, it blew people's minds. It really was a shock to a lot of people's systems that there was another story that was so similar to uh, Noah's Ark. Um, and it made people realize that it was more up for debate and more sort of um, communicating different uh, mythology, the, the same thing in different mythologies and ideas could be communicated from one mythology to another. Um, but it was a hard adjustment because they put so much stock in, um, you know, the biblical flood being totally unique and the origin of, you know, say life on earth and things like that. Uh, but I think it's very interesting to compare all these three stories and um, think about the origins of it all. Uh, one group of scholars thinks that maybe the Persian Gulf was really quite flooded at one point, uh, and that was the cause of the idea of the flood. I think uh, it's uh, simply plausible that, you know, floods were a constant thing um, in Mesopotamia and something that a lot of people had experienced. And any other comparisons we want to make here? Um, the idea of regret is interesting. God doesn't come right out and say that he regrets it, but he makes a promise not to do it again. Uh, the Sumerian gods definitely regret it. Zeus doesn't say he regrets it either, but he allows these two humans to uh, live and to repopulate the earth, uh, which feels kind of like regret. He, he changes his mind about trying to wipe everybody out. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on here. Um, I think one of the big differences in the Greek story is that you don't have any attempt to take the animals on board. So who knows how they survived? Um, it is the gods. Yeah, there's not super clear explanations for the existence of animals in Greek mythology, which is kind of interesting, unless you have things like people getting turned into them. Uh, we know about where wolves come from, but we don't know how the wolves survived the flood. So it's interesting what is considered important in the story and what gets left out. Um, and uh, mountains are present in all of uh, these stories, which is kind of fun and makes sense. Uh, for the Mesopotamians, the gods very much lived in the mountains. And I wonder if that uh, influenced uh, these other stories as well, the idea of fleeing to the mountains. But of course, it just makes sense. And uh, one element that's shared in all these stories, right, is there's an element of rebirth. Things start again after the destruction. Um, and, you know, there's a couple that survive, a male and a female, a man and a woman. Um, and so uh, they are able to, you know, start it all up again. Uh, in Noah's case, he brings his family with him, but, you know, you've got Noah and his wife, uh, and they are able to repopulate the earth in all these different stories in some way or another. Uh, so, you know, the destruction story is never, or it isn't usually the end of everything. Um, in this story, um, we see that uh, destruction is kind of about creation. They're kind of linked, um, that um, it's all about the idea of wiping the slate clean and having a new start. That's what it really comes right down to. Okay, uh, so uh, that's our little discussion of the flood. Um, 
And uh, yeah, there are other flood myths around the world and they frequently have some uh, ideas of a, a sort of change or rebirth in them. Uh, but this one, these ones seem to be maybe the most tightly connected. So with that done, uh, in the next video, I want to talk about a different story of destruction, uh, Ragnarok. And we'll see if there's any hope that remains after Ragnarok.